It is the 1860s in England. Two English gentlemen are talking together. Four children come up to one of the men, saying, Papa, can you continue the story you have been telling us before we go to bed? The papa turns to his friend. Do you mind? Fine by me. Moments later, the story was being told. Just then, Mr. Hardy's horse trod in a hole, and Mr. Hardy was thrown over his head, unconscious. Charlie and Hubert jumped off their horses, put the horses in a triangle around him, and leveled their rifles. Charlie's bullet crashed into the Indian who was scarcely 30 yards off. The boys continued firing with deadly destruction. Any Indian who came close fell dead. You know, George, I noticed how entranced your children were by that story you were telling them. You should publish that story. And that is how it all began. Hello, I'm Charles. And I'm James. We love history. And one of the things that really sparked our interest in history was G.A. Henty's books. Now on Henty Histories, we will learn about the man who created nearly a hundred historical fiction books. Now let's start the adventure. George Alfred Henty was born on December 8, 1832. He proved to be a sickly child and spent long periods of time in bed. He would later say that he spent his childhood in bed. It was during his time in bed that he developed a passion for reading and it was through his reading that he developed many different interests. When he was 14, Henty went to Westminster School in London for five years. It was here that he fought his first fight with the school bully. And he lost. He resolved to be victorious in all future battles. So he learned to box. For his mandatory activity, Henty chose boat rowing over cricket. And no, not those bugs. It's the game they have in England. They speak a strange language over there. When Henty left Westminster, he rightly felt himself to be a man. He was as fond of any of sports. He could box, wrestle, row, and defend himself against any with the foils. He also loved to walk, and could walk 50 miles a day with ease. After Westminster, Henty went to Caius College, Cambridge. However, after a year of college there, Henty was very dissatisfied. The college did not teach what he needed to learn to live the life he wanted. At this time, England was engulfed in the Crimean War, and it was the news of the suffering of the troops that inspired Henty to serve his country. George's father probably could not afford the 450 pounds needed for, the, for a captaincy. Wait a minute! Just how much of that is, what, how much would that cost in today's money in American? Well, let's see now, uh, you know, translated 1855 to uh, modern day poundage, uh, let's see, one pound equals approximately uh, 110 pounds today. Holy smokes, 110 pounds? This is added up. Well, let's change it. Uh, then that makes it uh, approximately 152 U.S. dollars uh, times 450 pounds equals sixty-eight thousand dollars. Are you crazy? For a commission as captain? No wonder England had many officer problems. All the good ones couldn't afford it. Holy smokes, that's about two years average U.S. salary. That's crazy. I don't even want to look at what a colonelcy in a guards regiment would cost. If this costs basically $70,000, it must be in the millions. Millions for a colonelcy in a guards regiment. This is ridiculous. 
When Henty arrived in the Crimea, he first served in the hospital commissariat at the notorious Scutari base. It was here that Florence Nightingale served as a heroine nurse from 1854 to 1857. In his time in the trenches around the beleaguered city of Sevastopol, Henty witnessed the horrible conditions the troops had to endure. Henty wrote many letters home describing the rain causing rivers of mud that men and animals sunk knee deep into. And as bad as that was, the nights were worse! For in addition to the rain and mud, it was never too dark or raining too hard to prevent the Russians from sorting out and attacking the frontline trenches. Advancing out of the darkness, the Russians would burst with fury and ferocious yells on the foremost trenches, the darkness making it hard to distinguish friend from foe. The Russians were always driven back, but leaving behind many dead and wounded. Henty's letters sent home were sent by his father to the Morning Advertiser newspaper and were published. Henty's writing career had begun. For his reckless performance of battle, Henty was awarded the Turkish Order of the Majidi. Majidi. Okay, the Turkish Order of Merit. Henty's stay in the Crimea was cut short, for he was invalided home in June 1855 with enteric fever. About 4,000 British soldiers would die in battle during the Crimean War, and around 15,500 from disease, including Henty's brother Eskutari. It was his time in the Crimea that made Henty a lifelong critic of government or military ineptitude. Boy, government sure don't change a lot. Henty then served in Belfast, Ireland, and in Italy, and was promoted to the rank of captain. Shortly after his marriage to Elizabeth Finucane in 1859, Henty resigned his commission. Henty was over 6 feet tall, 240 pounds, and sported an awesome beard. Henty had many interesting adventures. Once when in Italy, he was attacked by four armed cutthroats armed with knives. Okay, Fat Joey. There's an Englishman over there. He looks rich. He ought to be a good one to steal from. I don't know, Fat Louie. He has an awesome beard. Oh, come on. What does the beard have anything to do? Let us take our lives and attack! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> 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 Henty disarmed them all, and they understandably fled. When in the streets of Belfast, an Irishman insulted Henty's wife Elizabeth, and Henty promptly beat him to the ground. He even fought a duel with a Spaniard who insulted Queen Victoria. Yeah, beware of the man with the beard. Henty's marriage, however, was sadly short. After a long illness, Elizabeth died in 1865 leaving four children. Shortly after her death, Henty started to write articles for The Standard, a newspaper, as a war correspondent. During the war for Italian reunification, The Standard sent Henty as their personal correspondent, where Henty met the famous Italian patriot Giuseppe Garibaldi. It was when in Italy that Henty was nearly executed. Henty was never one to shy away from danger, so he traveled in disguise to get as close as possible to the action. He was caught by the Italian guides who carried him to their general. With his patience, firmness, passport, and letter of recommendation to the Italian armies, Henry was released with just a warning. 
In 1873, Henty was sent as a standards war correspondent during the Ashanti War. Now, I know what you are thinking. What the heck is the Ashanti War? But if you do know what it is, congratulations! You're one of the tiny, tiny, tiny minority who has even heard of the war. It was fought in modern-day Ghana. Okay, this country. Henty met up with African explorer Henry Morton Stanley to travel on his boat to get to the British Army. Now, if Henry Morton Stanley's name sounds familiar, he was the one who found missionary and explorer Dr. Livingston. Dr. Livingston, I presume. Both Henty and Stanley marched with the army and fought in the Battle of Kumase. Before Henty's adventures in the Ashanti War, he had suffered from some ill health, forcing him to stay in England for a time. Henty had written several novels around this time, with indifferent success. During this time, every night, Henty would tell stories to his children before bed. Some stories would be finished in one night, while others took weeks. One night, a friend came over for a visit. And during this visit, his friend watched Henty tell one of his stories to his children. And during this, he knows how spellbound Henty's children were when he continued the story that he had been telling them. Henty's friend said that he should publish this story, and it was through this that Henty's successful writing career would begin. Henty published a story he told his children in 1870. The book, Out on the Pampas, or The Young Settlers, featured the young Hardy family, emigrating from England to the Argentine Republic. The four Hardy children were named after Henty's own children. The Hardys have many adventures in farming and fighting the Indians. Two years later, Henty published The Young Frank Tours, I think that's how you pronounce it, and their adventure in the Franco-Prussian War. This was Henty's first book of putting his characters in a historical setting or war. With the success of Out on the Pampas and The Young Frank Tours, Henty began to write a lot more seriously. His next book, The Young Buglers, A Tale of the Peninsula War, was published in 1880. The next year, Henty published two books, The Cornet of Horse, A Tale of Marlborough's Wars, and In Times of Peril, A Tale of India. Henty's stories then came fast and furious. Henty then started publishing as many as seven books in a year. One of Henty's secretaries reported that Henty would pace up and down his study, a dictating as fast as the poor secretary could write down the story. Henty's stories usually revolved around a young man in his teens who would have adventures and many historical events. The history in Henty's books is remarkably accurate. As a student and lover of history, Henty always made a point of historical accuracy. Hollywood, take note! Also, Shad, he was also very accurate with medieval armor, weapons, and tactics. And he also appreciated the power of the shtick. Only once did Henty willfully change a real event in history in one of his books. This was in the book In the Reign of Terror, A Story of the French Revolution. Henty did admit in the preface that he moved that particular event forward in time so that he could use it for his hero and heroines to escape from France. Henty's heroes always displayed many great qualities, such as manliness, self-reliance, modesty, patience, chivalry, honorableness, bravery, selflessness, and resourcefulness. They do not even hesitate to help a wounded enemy or even help an enemy damsel in distress. In fact, Aragorn for Tolkien's Lord of the Rings fits the Henty mold very well, with the exception of his age. Henty's heroes meet many famous people throughout history, like 
Prince Eugene of Savoy. King Alfred the Great. The Duke of Wellington. Marshal Ney. Napoleon Bonaparte himself. Stonewall Jackson. And General Robert E. Lee. The Duke of Marlborough. Titus. King Gustavus Adolphus. Carl the Twelfth. Admiral de Coligny. General Turin. William the Silent. Queen Elizabeth. And many others. They would travel the world and take plays in historical events from all the way from ancient Egypt to the Box Rebellion in China, 1900. After writing 99 books and 53 short stories, G. Henty died on November 16, 1902, aboard his yacht. His last novel, By Conduct and Courage, was completed by his son, Charles Henty. The London Sketch wrote about Henty's death that the boys of England lose one of the best friends they ever had. It is estimated that the number of his published books ranged up to 25 million. Henty was known as the boy's own historian and the prince of storytellers. Now we will tell you about G. A. Henty in World War II. Wait a minute! Henty died in 1902. How could he be involved in World War II, which started in 1939? Earlier, if you include the Japanese invasion of China. Well, in 1915, Clarence Clough was born in Saskatchewan, Canada. What a name for a province. He grew up on his family farm and only received an 8th grade education. However, he loved to read, especially Henty books. He joined the Canadian forces in World War II and landed on Juneau Beach on D-Day 1944 and fought all the way to Germany. Now a sergeant, Clough was ordered to hold a position that the Germans were expected to attack the next day. Well aware that the Germans loved their counterattacks and were often successful in them, Sergeant Clough remembered a handy story of soldiers in a similar position. Clough ordered his exhausted men to dig a deep trench in the frozen ground, cut down trees, and line the trenches with head logs. The men were not happy. They grumbled all night saying it was too cold. The units on the right and left did not dig in nearly as heavily. The next morning, sure enough, the Germans counterattacked. The line held. While the units to the right and to the left suffered casualties, Sergeant Clough's men didn't suffer a single casualty. Sergeant Clough attributed his men's survival to G. A. Henty. In 2014, at the age of 99, Sergeant Clough passed away with many fine Henty volumes on his shelves. His obituary read like the description of one of Henty's heroes. He demonstrated intelligence, perseverance, honor, decency, bravery, humility, a good sense of humor, and a willingness to help others. Now, there are a lot of controversies about what Henty believed in, and we will address them now. For one, smoking. If you read Henty's stories, you'll find that his characters often smoke, and often even encourage it. And some of you people might find that wrong and, and, you know, bad, since we now know that smoking's bad. But, it may surprise you to know, but in Henty's day, it was considered healthy to smoke. Yeah, I did not make that up. And that is why many of Henty's characters smoke and often endorse it. So if you read a part that promotes smoking, just try and ignore that and remember the times he lived in. One of the biggest and most concerning accusations against Henty was racism. Now what is racism? 
Well, let's let Noah Webster define it. Having, reflecting, or fostering the belief that race is a fundamental detriment of human traits and capacities, and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race, or of related to or characterized by the systematic oppression of a racial group to the social, economic, and political advantage of another. Now before we address Henty, we want to make sure we make clear our perspective of racism. It's disgraceful, disgusting, despicable. Also, we believe that there is not different human races, but one human race. Kill Rain from the movie Gettysburg describes our position on racism very well. The thing is, you cannot judge a race. Any man who judges by the group is a peewit. You take men one at a time. Now was Henty a racist? Well, Henty does write some things that can be deemed racist, but a lot can boil down to different cultures and not necessarily race. Henty firmly believed that Western slash Christian civilization, particularly English Christian civilization, was the best in the world and superior to all, the, all other cultures. Now you may disagree with that, but that's, that was Henty's opinion. One of the things that supports this is how Henty viewed the Boers or Afrikaners of South Africa. The Boers were descendants of Dutch settlers who formed their own republics. During the 19th century, Great Britain and the Boers struggled for the control of South Africa. Henty was misinformed of the Boers and held to the typical stereotypes of the Boers held by Englishmen at the time. So it was not just non-whites that Henty had mistaken views on. But in Henty's book, by right of conquest, or with Cortez in Mexico, 1891, the hero, Roger, an English boy who was shipwrecked on the Mexican coast, has to leave an Aztec slave girl whom he befriended and who taught him how to speak Aztec. It is as bad, he said to himself, as it was saying goodbye to Dorothy and Agnes. Color does not matter much after all. Malinche is just as good and kind as if she were white. Other Henty characters marry non-whites as well. The biggest question to determine whether Henty's books promotes racism is how Henty's heroes treated those considered beneath them, and especially non-whites. In all the Henty books that I have read, that I have not seen one instance where the hero of the story M mistreats anyone, whether those, whether that person be not from a lower class in themselves, or even if they're non-white. But he treats them as a friend and a brother. And quite often, there, he'll have a supporter, whether someone from a lower class or a non-white, quite often they start as, as a servant, and they prove an able second to the main character and will help get him out of prison when they get captured or help him in other circumstances. In Henty's book, On the Irrawaddy, Henty's main character has by far one of the greatest rescue attempts ever, and it is to an unknown and potentially dead Burmese peasant. The main character who was captured earlier in the war has now escaped and he heard a cry for help, and he found a tiger standing over two men. One of them was clearly dead, but the other, the main character, thought that he was alive. He saw that the two men had their muskets by them, and, armed with only a knife, he crept up slowly to the tiger, which was growling so it didn't hear his approach, and stabbed him in the back. Now, while the blow was mortal, the tiger could still come back and attack. The main character then snatched up the two muskets and shot the tiger dead. Now, as far as he knew, those muskets could have been unloaded. 
for the main character to thus save someone who may not even be alive and trusting that they have loaded muskets and that they're not going to misfire takes a great amount of courage. And this is to a people who do not like any white men. In conclusion, Henty probably did have some mistaken prejudices like almost everyone in Victorian England. But through the heroes in his books, who he wants the boys of England to become, he never promotes prejudice or racism. The last major criticism of Henty was his very pro-English empire stances. This goes back to Henty's belief in English culture. He believed that colonizing other nations and giving them English culture was desirable. It's the same view that President Bush had with nation building and making democracies across the world. However, Henty was against all the wars that Great Britain slash the East India Company started with little to no justification. For example, Henty was adamant in the wrongness of the first British invasion of Afghanistan. So once again, while Henty's beliefs were misguided, he held them for understandable reasons. Henty lived an exciting and adventurous life, and then he wrote stories of adventure and character to be enjoyed by millions. Henty's books have been republished recently by several publishers. The best is by Robinson Books, link in the description. If you want audiobooks, many of Henty's books are in audio form. The first is by Jim Hodges, once again link in the description. You'll have to pay for these ones. The second option is LibriVox.org. Now while LibriVox.org is free, once again the, the, this link, there'll be a link in the description, the problem with this is the readers are all voluntary. Okay, you're not guaranteed a good reader. Like Gary Oldman, uh, he's a poor reader. But there are some good readers out there. The reader for With More Karuna and the sequel Under Wellington's Command is a very good reader. Now here is the top 10 stories from G.E. Henty that we would recommend if you're interested in reading his books. Number 10, The Cat of Abastes, A Tale of Ancient Egypt. This was the first Henty book I became acquainted with when my mom read it to me and my sister when we were young. Number 9. Okay, this is kind of a cheat to get an extra book in there, but as they're both the same story, I'm letting it slide. And they are With More at Karuna and Under Wellington's Command. These books take place during the Peninsular War. Number 8. The Lion of St. Mark. This is a story about medieval Venice and one of the greatest trials that she ever faced in the Teogian War. I think I pronounced that right. Number 7. St. Bartholomew's Eve. This is a story about the Huguenot Wars. Particularly, the main character goes through the Second, Third, and Fourth Huguenot Wars. And of course, the book includes the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Number 6. The Cornet of Horse. This is one of Henty's earlier books, and is about the War of Spanish Succession. Number 5. The Lion of the North, A Tale of the Times of Gustavus Adolphus. This is the first Henty book that I ever read, and I always have loved it. It's about the Thirty Years' War, particularly from when Gustavus Adolphus landed in Germany to the disastrous Swedish defeat at Nordlingen. Number 4. Out on the Pampas. If you're looking for more story and less history, this is a good book for you, as it tells the adventures of the Hardys in trying to create a farm in the Argentine Pampas. Number 3. In Freedom's Cause. Now, if you are like me and cannot stand the movie Braveheart, this is what Braveheart should have been. The main character fights alongside Wallace and Robert the Bruce. 
This is actually one of Henty's longest books time period-wise, as most of Henty's books cover, you know, five years or less. This one covers the entire War for Independence, up until the Battle of Bannockburn. Number 2. Beric the Briton, A Tale of the Roman Invasion This is a story about Boudicca's revolt against the Romans, and the main character, a Briton, and his fight against the Romans, and he will eventually be captured and sent to Rome as a gladiator, where he will fight a lion without a weapon. Yeah, read the book. <laughs> it's, it's a great story. And number one, The Dragon and the Raven. This book takes place during the reign of King Alfred the Great, and the main character is a loyal supporter of him, and creates his own ship to help fight the Danes, a.k.a. the Vikings. It is a great story, taking all the way from Norway to Wessex, England, to Paris, to even the Mediterranean. This is by far the one book that we recommend the most. This concludes our history of George Alfred Henty. We hope you've enjoyed this video. And if you did, Please leave a like and consider subscribing and hitting that bell so that you might be notified of any future videos. Comment below for your thoughts. Just be respectful for other people's views on the issues. So until our next adventure, farewell. One video down, hundreds more to go. Forget it. <laughs>